Hello, you are listening to The Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer, Amazon number one best-selling author. You can find out more about me and my work at katherinekerrigan.com and unlimitedenergynow.com. While you're there, definitely sign up for my newsletter so you can learn even more about how you can heal yourself naturally. Now, our guests today are... Anna Forrest, and Jose Calarco. And you can find out more about them and their wonderful work at, we will give your website, please. www.forest.yoga. Fantastic. Okay, forest.yoga. And Anna Forrest and Jose Calarco, I know you all have different uh, titles at Forest Yoga. Will you explain for our audience what you do at Forest Yoga? Okay, well, we're both co-directors of Forest Yoga. So for the last 10 years, uh, I met Anna in Sydney 10 years ago in an elevator going up, <laughs> not going down. <laughs> that was a great sign. And that night I did an Aboriginal ceremony for Australia, Australian Aborigine, which is the world's oldest living culture. And after that, the rest was history once we did that blessing for Anna and we became life partners from that. Mm. What we both didn't know at the time when we met in the elevator was that Anna had done a ceremony to the universe mm. to meet her ultimate partner and I had gone to my clairvoyant to meet my ultimate partner, who she said is not in Australia, is overseas. So the rest is history. So we became co-directors of Forest Yoga. Anna had been on the yoga scene for 35, over 35 years already. And Anna was looking for a change. I was involved in Indigenous dance. So, you know, we were touring the world nonstop with our show. And Anna was touring as well. And I have been managing several international businesses, including my international dance and cultural company. So I came into Forest Yoga to reinvent and re-energize the business. And uh, so we're both co-directors, we're both yoga teachers, we're both singers, musicians, et cetera, et cetera. And we put two lifelong talents into one room. So we got the advantage over other yoga teachers who work solely by themselves because we have two lifetimes of experience and talents. And also Anna and I are vastly different teachers. If we were the same, there'd be no need for one of us. That's a beautiful story. And for our audience, you can listen to my interviews. I did an interview with Anna and Jose about how to attract your soul mate, your, your twin flame, and also about how yoga can help you overcome trauma. Now, what we're going to be talking about today is how to make a good living as a yoga instructor. And before a recording, I got online and I looked, the average hourly wage for a yoga instructor in the US is $31 an hour. And in the UK, it's 25 euros an hour. <laughs> and again, you can only work so many hours a day. So Jose and Anna, what are the big secrets about how to make a good living as a yoga instructor? Well, firstly, let, let me add, uh, we have our own yoga business like you, you got to start humbly and you got to start at the bottom. I might get Anna to, to start here because she started way back in the seventies and Anna, you can probably do a, an intro on that. I think what's really important is to be willing to do what's ever necessary. So for example, when I started teaching yoga, I was giving away my time a lot mm -hmm. because I knew I needed to accrue the experience. And so it felt like that that was what was most important. And then I had to, I had to change my attitudes on a regular basis because I had a lot of 
destructive attitudes. Like for instance, if I was teaching a class and there was five people in it, I'd get really mad ab to, about all the people that weren't there. And I needed to change my attitude and get very involved and enchanted with the people who were there. Because my getting mad at the people who didn't show up wasn't going to attract more people in, but it was going to be a, a abrasive energy for the people who were there. And so to keep shifting my crappy attitude to something that was enticing instead of abrasive. Yeah. And, and Catherine, there is 30 million yoga teachers in the world, you know. So how is you, the listener, going to differentiate between 30 million people who have done a course? Mm -hmm. Anna and I have done it. However, it's been a long, long road for both of us. I must say that when I moved into this yoga business, the first thing to catch out was fraud. Mm. So when I first met Anna, she had been to hospital two or three times. And I looked at her schedule and I could see that the management was running her ragged. Now, why? Why was the management running her ragged like this? And ultimately, I looked at the bottom, I looked at the P&Ls for the past five years, and I could I circled the problem spots. So I found that the accountant was stealing money. And, and Catherine, we're not just talking about 5,000 or 10,000, we're talking about big money. So the first thing we had to do was clean up the business and get all the thieves out of it. And there was more than one thief. Mm -hmm. So Anna and I have had a checkered 10 years together. And this wasn't the only time I, I say to yoga centers out there, know your accountant well, uh, because all it takes from an, an accountant to be a bad accountant is an opportunity. So I put a watchdog on our accountants for a little while because we were a business generating over a million. Now, a lot of yoga teachers out there on $31 an hour aren't going to be generating a million dollars. However, Anna and I then began working ourselves ragged as well, 35 cities a year. Mm -hmm. We'd be in Moscow one Monday, China the next Monday, Norway the next Monday, UK, England. So what happened while Anna and I were on doing a retreat in Tulum, Mexico, the new accountant stole $90,000. And so I'm just warning yoga centers everywhere. It doesn't matter how much you think you know the accountant. Opportunity breeds thieves. So Anna and I don't have the traditional way of managing. We have more a shamanic and spiritual way of managing. So I've created business courses because all my businesses have been international businesses not just national business. And one thing Anna and I have our fingers on is the global yoga scene because we're dealing with yoga centers in China, in Barcelona, France, Norway. We're dealing with yoga centers all over the world, not just in the USA or we're not just working for one yoga center. A common problem for all yogis and all yoga centers is, and you're not going to believe this, Catherine, they don't answer calls or email. <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm you laughing. Have this problem. <laughs> you, have, you must know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. I Well, I've taught yoga for 38 years. At age 64, I still teach yoga nine times a week. I always answer phone calls and emails. <laughs> Catherine, you are, you are absolutely spectacular. But it ain't the case for the majority of yoga centers all over the world. They take their eye off the ball. And when you take the eye off the ball, like Anna and I did a couple of times, then this opens to opportunity. And people should always treat your business like theirs because it's good karma in the end. So when Anna and I teach the business course, we teach it from a spiritual and shamanic angle. So we've created like 12 just little points for people to be aware of. 
So also, I think that's really important that people are willing to give their heart and soul and let that imbue what they're doing because we are taught in so many different ways in our culture to disconnect and that's deadly. There's no way of growing through disconnect. And so to be willing to care so deeply about your teaching and to care so deeply about the ways that your teaching get fed, which is through the business, not to separate like, oh, the business is, you know, that's for corporations and have that kind of crappy attitude. It's like one of the things I learned from Jose that I absolutely love because I have a difficult time with computers and I didn't do the email and all that kind of stuff. I was one of those. And he <laughs> said, each email is sending out a seed of the future. Mm. And I thought, okay, that's a game changer for me. And to recognize that when you put that 100% into what you're doing, whether it's you're doing your email or you're teaching your class, the, the cosmos pays you back. If you withhold, if you do it in a lazy way, if you do it in an inauthentic way, then you don't get much back. You know, like Jose had asked earlier, like what's going to differentiate you, the listener, you, the yoga teacher from everybody else is be authentic mm. because most people are fake. Mm. So when you're authentic, then your students have a chance to bathe in learning how to be authentic. And that will in and of itself make better humans. Great, great insight. So you all have created a course about the business of yoga. What are absolutely so what are some of the key lessons that you teach in your course? Yeah, well, I, I must say, Catherine, uh, way back in 1986 and 87, way before 10 years before Anthony Robbins, two of my investors already begun doing business seminars. Now, I'm, I, I don't know if you're big on these business seminars where people are jumping up and down and going <laughs> bananas. A, a lot of people <laughs> like that. Anna and I, uh, it's not our cup of tea. But I was there. I was at the beginning of when business and money seminars begun. And they begun as a good thing, you know, teaching people how to create wealth and giving them steps to financial freedom. But then somewhere down the track, they became fraudulent. You know, a whole bunch of frauds came in, people teaching before they actually learned anything and, uh, you know, promising wealth and all this nonsense when they themselves hadn't experienced any success. Uh, but anyway, here is the shamanic ways Anna and I have deeply been involved in shamanism, myself with the Australian Aborigines and Anna with the Native Americans. The, the first one is intention. Mm. Like intention. Okay. And we're having a little bit of a technical difficulty. And Forest yoga classes begin with intention. Mm. The second step is lateral thinking. Now, I've got to say, putting creativity into your business. I must say that the yoga scene is so one-dimensional. Yoga teachers are absolutely just one-dimensional. You'll see their Instagram posts day in, day out, doing the same post, doing the same old shit for 10 years. So we need to bring lateral thinking and people say, but how can I think laterally? And you, once you begin to explore lateral thinking, the lateral thinking comes to you. So, it, it meets, so yeah. Jose, can you explain for our audience, what do you mean by lateral thinking? Vertical thinking is just common sense. Lateral thinking, yeah, vertical thinking is just when we apply common everyday sense. Lateral thinking is what actually brings in the it, it brings in ideas and sometimes the information already exists but you just reshape that information so if you look at our website you look at our brochures you look at our trailers they're all lateral thinking if you look at the common yoga teacher the 30 million they're just echoes of everything that's ever been they're just an echo mm. you need to be yourself you need to trust the creative process at some stage Step number three, giving and receiving. 
a lot of people don't really believe in giving or receiving or to become miracle ready. Mm. So this is something with the Aboriginal people. When we are miracle ready, then the universe pays us to be ourselves. This is a shamanic thing. But most people aren't miracle ready because they don't really believe in themselves because they're not exploring their own ideas. They're just an echo of their teacher. Number four, uh, I'll have to go these through qu quickly. <laughs> Sorry, Catherine. I'd like to explore these, but we do this in our business course. Step number four, ceremony and prayer. Mm. Now, you probably saw The Secret, the biggest selling DVD of all time, sold 50 million copies. Believe it or not, my Aboriginal dance group was actually appeared on The Secret right at the end. Mm. And it was produced in Australia, The Secret. Uh, ceremony and prayer, I've got to say that it's not just like the secret says, like you just sit down and visualize cars and yachts and boats coming your way. 90% is hard work. 10% is ceremony and prayer. So when my Aboriginal uh, company went from nothing to the world's biggest events, it was actually 90% labor, but we did do a lot of ceremonies and prayers at trees, forests, rivers, streams, and it really does work creative visualization number four uh sorry number five rather is the work environment now i can see catherine from your office there that you are neat orderly structured that already tells me that you are a neat orderly structured person when you go into someone's office and it looks like a cacophony it looks like a barnyard then <laughs> usually that person's mind is the same as their work environment. So you need to create feng shui where the workspace that you're in is welcome, you, where you can create a workspace where you can hear angels whisper, not mm -hmm. devils breathing down your neck. But that the work environment also goes with the other is keeping immaculate health. Because without health, you got nothing. If you've got no energy to get up and do four hours of email and a two hour practice, the, this is the, the most important thing is your health. Because if your faculties aren't working, you cannot ignite your dreams. Can I pause for a yeah. moment? Yeah, Anna. With that, many times when people are attempting to be conscientious about their business, they put their business in front of the things that will keep them healthy, like their yoga practice. That's a mistake. Mm -hmm. Your yoga practice needs to be scheduled in there and prioritized because everything will go better when you're doing your practice and you're taking the time to eat good, nutritious food. Because all of that virtue can then feed into your business. And that clear, clear mindedness can then feed into your business. If you're exhausted, if you're not practicing, if you're resentful because your business is taking up your practice time, then that foulness is what feeds into your business. Great so, insight. I, yeah. And with that, let's take a break and listen to one of our commercial sponsors here at UK Health Radio. And we're going to be right back with Anna Forrest and Jose Calarco with more valuable insights about how to make a great living as a yoga instructor. So Anna Forrest and Jose Calarco, I love that you have created a business course for yoga teachers because mm -hmm. so many people think, well, it's just about learning how to do a triangle and then they know how to do a triangle. And then, as you said, they just become a carbon copy of anyone else, everyone else, and then they don't know how to make a living. Yeah. And I love that yeah. you talk about environment because as a medical intuitive, I always say, environment is the most powerful factor and absolutely you can take the orchids in my healing room and put them in the dark and not water them and they will die 
And yeah. so when we create the optimal environment, then everyone flourishes. Absolutely. Environment shapes the soul. So if you're in a constricted environment that's dirty and you become non-productive, feng shui has been around for a long, long time. And feng shui is a reality, not just in Chinese culture, but in all culture. And then also keeping the good health. That is so important, Catherine, because when I met Anna, she'd been hospitalized several times. And really, she only had maybe 12 to 24 months left in a career. So mm. what we needed to do was reshape how we're going to do this. And now Anna is at her peak at 65 years of old. She is at her peak. So, you know. I want to add something. Yeah. I want to, I want to shift a little bit. Like one of the ways that we got ready to meet with you today is we went down to the pier mm. and sat in the sunlight looking at the water and mm. fed some crows which mm. we love to do. We love to feed our bird people. And that was part of what got us happy and ready to communicate here. And it didn't take very long because we needed to get back, right? So we're about 30 minutes in the sunlight with the water and with the wild ones. And I love that. Yes, <laughs> and that that feeds our heart and soul. And then we can bring that into this interview. Yeah. So that brings us, Catherine, because I know we've got to speed along here. Yeah. You know, during our business course, it's, it's a wonderful course, also has videos like the night I met Anna, and it's it's very exciting. Uh, step number six is vibration. Business, personal names, logos, colors, blah, 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 blah. You may not know it, but Anna and I both changed our names for success. Mm. So we went from prey to predator well and i don't, now let me uh not predator like the way we we are saying but i was a numerologist for for many many years and a psychic clairvoyant and the importance of going by your correct name mm. now anna's is a classic example how she structured her name she can tell you about it like people that don't believe that a name doesn't have a vibration, think again, because everything has a vibration in the universe, letters, numbers, colors, logos, everything. And we go into detail in this in the business course. Well, I just had a friend of mine who was a numerologist and worked with names. This was years and years and years ago. And he said, any way that I add up your name, that has catastrophe in it. And I oh. thought, yeah, that's my life. <laughs> you know, it's like one drama, one catastrophe after the other. And so we started to play with it but because I had already begun to get my name as a professional name. So I didn't want to change it, but I changed some of the letters mm. so that it, it it took it out of that catastrophe realm. And then, of course, I needed to start to become alert for the patterns that ended up setting me up for catastrophe. And we've already talked about some of them, like letting myself get worked so hard that I cannot keep track of what's happening in my business on the money level, on the booking level, on other aspects of it. You know, just thinking like, you know, my, my gift is teaching and I have these other parts of my business assigned to other people to handle, but without me overseeing it, it ended up as a catastrophe. So that was really helpful to just shift. I had my name was A-N-N-A -N -N -A, Forest. And I changed it to A N A T for tiger forest. So I put my one of my main medicine animals right there in the middle. And Catherine, I was the same. I, I was born Jose Antonio Calaco in Argentina. And when I came to Australia to get rid of the ethnic sound, they changed it to Joe Anthony Calaco. And it wasn't until years later that a clairvoyant, a very talented woman, came and said, why aren't you going by your real name? She had no idea who, you know, that I had changed my name. And I said, how did you know that? She said, you need to go back to Jose Antonio Calaco, your original name. I did. And the rest is history. But of course, I put in the work effort, you know, in the physical plane, emotional, mental and spiritual planes. But I had to get that, that monkey off my back to go back to the original name. Now, I that, love that yeah. you will talk about vibration in business because one of the things we know in natural healing is that energy always flows from highest to lowest vibration. 
And yes. as teachers and as leaders, we need to be in the highest vibration state possible. So you talked about practicing your yoga and eating well and being yes. conscious about every aspect of our business so that we are leading from the highest vibration that we're possible that's possible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Catherine. So here's another example that I want to give you about changing the business. It's like with my website, I was not able to communicate well enough to the people that were dealing with the website because I didn't know how to put a website together to get the vision, the colors, the feel of it. And so I abandoned it. You know, it's just like the website, someone else is dealing with that and I can't stand it. I can't even stand to look at it. And then when Jose came in and he started to apply lateral his, thinking yes but also <laughs> his artistic talent mm. he could communicate with our computer people to say this is what we need no not that this and it became such a work of art that for the very first time actually represented us yeah and and that it took years to get it to represent us the way we want to but now it does and that clicked in a really big piece for us yeah, and, and you know the big picture. Just as you know, when we talk about yoga, mind, body, and spirit, and a good yoga practice really helps ground you because so many yeah. people are out of their body in their head or totally disconnected. I actually feel that dealing with business, you know, dealing with books, <laughs> knowing how much money you have, knowing <laughs> that's very <laughs> grounding, right? There's oh, it's it's wonderful. Yes. I enjoy email. Listen, I enjoy email as much as I enjoy piano practice. And people go, oh, you're insane, Jose. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's the same thing. When I'm creating beautiful, I, I do a three-hour piano practice every night, and it's just as beautiful and symphonic as doing email. I don't change personality, whether it's email, cooking, doing yoga, or piano. I'm the same person with intent passion and purpose in every single area and yeah. it's part of what we call a dharma joust it's like you may be in love with your yoga this was i'm just using a personal example and hate the computer that was me and i would i would build justification stories around that you know like why that was that was a good attitude to hold but it absolutely wasn't and i had to grow up out of that and apply the discipline of my love for my yoga my spirit pledge of mending the rainbow hoop of the people the love of what we do together and then bring my best energy to what i do on the computer not my worst energy so like my writing improved my communications to my staff and to the people around the world that ask for help all improved but it, the improvement was necessary within my own heart and my own actions. I yeah. love that story. You know, I, on a personal note, I'm 64. When I was about 50, 51, I got a divorce. And when I was married, my ex-husband managed all my finances. So, <laughs> and so I get a divorce and not only did I get a divorce, then I had to suddenly deal with money. And I hadn't done that for 18 years. It was one of the best things that ever happened to me. And, um, so not when everything was handed to me, it was a in complete mess. Uh, there was taxes owed to every government agency you could. Oh name. no! It was just, <laughs> it was so bad. I remember one day I went to the mailbox and there was thirteen separate letters from the Georgia Department of Revenue. <laughs> I joked it was <laughs> a situation for which swearing and alcohol were invented, and I fixed everything. And so now I'm, you know, I own my house, I own my debt, I own my car, I have zero debt, I have investments at Morgan Stanley, I'm con I'm su conventionally successful doing an unconventional career, but for my, for those people listening, it's about dealing with reality, right? Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and by grounding yourself in what's really going on, and by by dealing with reality and knowing all that, then I'm financially free. And when I do my work, I'm completely present with the people that I work with. 
And I'm not sitting there worried about, am I going to be able to pay my bills? Like I'm able, it, it actually frees you up in my opinion. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. Totally. And just another thing on the, the ceremony and prayer aspect, you don't always get what you put out there and you know what? Sometimes that is a blessing, not getting what you want <laughs> when you want it is an actual blessing. And I say to your listeners, embrace that philosophy. You know, there's been several times, Anna and I, we had a teacher training canceled in Connecticut and it was like, oh my God, this is the end of the world. This is the end of the world. And uh, and I thought, okay, embrace the philosophy. Why did it get canceled? And not too long after my dance company, we picked up the Olympic games in 2016. So Anna was free. So Anna and I went off to Mexico, Trinidad Brazil. and Brazil for the Olympics ceremonies. And that came in and filled the void of a canceled event. If the event wasn't canceled, then that opening wouldn't have existed. So, you know, you're not always going to get what you want when you want it. And you've got to be OK with that. Yeah, it's sort of like be willing to dance to where the openings are and the openings that you want to make. I feel that another really important part about business, what we were discussing is like to do your work, your teaching, your your computer work, whatever aspect of your work there is and the aspects of your life in a way that makes you proud of yourself, in a way that mm -hmm. feeds your dream. And again, with this disconnect, we've had so much killing of the soul and killing of the dream with our people. And it's time to redream. It's like, why are you doing this good work? You know, get focused on what it is that motivates you to get up out of bed when you're feeling lazy or apathetic or sick or whatever's going on. You just had a divorce, you know, and so you're going to stay in bed and mope for a yeah. while. So get your ass up and do something worthwhile. I love All right. That. Having said that, I'm going to move on to step seven <laughs> because I know that the viewers are going to go, wow, it's a big step from six to seven. Okay. And step seven, Catherine, is acknowledgement. And acknowledgement is one of the most powerful tools. If you've had anything to do with Indigenous people, acknowledgement is the key factor. So in Australia, before we did anything, we always acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. We acknowledge the ancestors that have come before us. We acknowledge the teaching team, the staff and everything. And when you acknowledge someone, you get a hundred, a thousand percent work effort. Now in Forest Yoga, when I first came in, acknowledgements weren't happening. And this causes bitchiness and gossip and blah, blah, blah. But when you acknowledge people for what they're doing, that is a powerful tool. And, and it's an indigenous tool, acknowledgement. Now with that, let's take a break and listen to a message from one of our, co our commercial sponsors here at UK Health Radio. And we'll be right back with Anna Forrest and Jose Calarco so you can learn how to make a great living as a yoga instructor. Okay, Jose Calarco, Anna Forrest. I'm on the edge of my seat. I love your business principles. <laughs> and Absolutely. I, I, I'm kind of like you. I've had my own business since I was 34, 30 years. And so I have my own ideas about how to run business. And you won't hear them in, in business school. <laughs> so never. never. <laughs> okay, so number seven was acknowledge people. Love that. That's correct. Number eight is a very, uh, very orthodox one, which is just per persistence and perseverance. Mm -hmm. You know, there's going to be days you don't feel like doing email, you don't feel like doing this, but just do it. Do your practice, do your email. Look, a lot of people say, oh, I didn't answer your email for six weeks, Jose, because I wasn't feeling well. But they were still on their phone for, you know, 12 hours of that day, you know, doing social media and wasting time. Uh, and as I said, the international problem of yoga 
and yoga teachers and yoga centers is they do not answer email. And that is a big mistake. If you look at Anthony Robbins, Richard Branson, all these self-made successful people, they get up in the morning and the first thing they do is grab their cup of coffee and do their email first because the email is the seeds to the future. Number nine is organization. Now, I don't just mean organizing all the external things around you, your staff and all that, but you also need to organize your computer. Now, when you get to 1 million files, films and photos on your computer, if you don't know how to find something in your Dropbox or your Google Drive or whatever, then you waste a lot of time. So organization of computer is something totally radical and new. And all the people go, ah, we have to organize our computer. Yes, you have a million files on it. Find me this from 2016 or 2000. And people go, oh, I spent two hours trying to find it. So you really need to be structured externally and also electronically on your computer. And then, of course, uh, number 10 is courage. Now, a lot of yoga, Anna and I always have courage. When we do these world tours, by the way, we're not guaranteed any income. Mm. Everything is a 50-50 gamble with, with the venues that we work with. So it takes courage to put on a big tour and know that you could lose twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 putting on the tour. So there needs to be some sort of trust. Now, a lot of yoga centers just stay within their little uh, vertical thinking. Uh, but every now and again, they should host international teachers and bring them in and create new energy in the room. But most yoga centers, the majority of yoga centers are very conservative, but the ones that really open up and take chances, they're the highly successful ones and they survived the 2020 uh, lockdowns. Uh, some of the bigger yoga places like Yoga Works did not survive. And, uh, you know, at least half the yoga centers in the USA shut down. Uh, yeah, which is not a good thing, but the ones that were operating on courage and creativity and lateral thinking, all those places are still there today. Of course, number 11 is visualization. We talked about the secret for a long, long time. Visualization is just a small part of the whole of also working hard, but it is actually true. It's just that the secret oversimplified that. So I had a whole bunch of friends going, oh, I'm going to spend three hours on the rocking chair visualizing my Ferrari. Uh, <laughs> I waste your time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then the, the final step is start now. People go, oh, yeah, I'll start when I've got 5,000 in the bank or I'll start this. But a lot of the things you can do, like writing blogs and getting photo sessions, doing, you know, there's so many things that you can actually start doing now. So, for example, people put up obstacles with starting. So it's like, oh, I can't do a photo session because I don't have the money to pay a photographer. It's like, well, what about doing trade out? Mm -hmm. Barter is a time honored system. So what about if you work out a system with a photographer, like you'll give them this amount of yoga and they'll do this many shots for you. And then you've got a start for some good head shots and some good yoga shots and because people need to see you they need to see yeah and, and you can write out your bio now a lot of people don't keep dates times mm. and they don't keep their work history detailed and anna's one of those people i said anna how many trainings have you done i have no idea uh, you know <laughs> i she had no idea about anything and i said we need to start every time we do a training, the date, the host, blah, blah, blah. And you keep a detailed history. Ultimately, as when you get to our age, Catherine, then we know in 1970, we were here, 1980, we were here. And all this information appears on blogs and websites. Uh, so it becomes your epitaph. Oops. Yep, someone's trying to. Can you see us? Because okay. Yeah, sorry, we just had like a. 
It's okay. I can see you perfectly. So what? Yeah, no. What? Well, uh, as we had a, we had someone try to interfere in the call, uh, trying to run a scan. But uh, yeah, it's very important. Like if someone says, "Okay, what have you done with Forest Yoga?" I say, "Well, I've done twenty five trainings." And here's the years and blah, blah, blah that I've done. If I ask Anna that question, she only knows we've done 25 trainings with Jose. Record keeping becomes more and more important, immaculate as the years roll on. And people don't understand that. People, oh, Jose keeps track of how many trainings he's done. Uh, duh, yeah, yeah, don't you? <laughs> I'll give you an example. It's like when we had to apply for a work visa to the UK, they wanted to know our 10 year history mm. of travel of the trainings. And it's like, wow, if Jose hadn't been keeping track of it, it would have been really a difficult swamp to navigate that. So that's one example. Another is like on your full resume, it should list what you do because people do judge you by that. They want to know if you actually have a real body of knowledge instead of you know, oh yeah, I took yoga teacher training that was a weekend long and now I'm a teacher. It's like when you have thousands of teaching hours, it's good to have proof of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, when you get your yoga license, they want to know how many hours you've done. And if you're not keeping track of what you've done, uh, it's just all hearsay. But one important thing that I wanted to speak to you about uh, today, Catherine, was social media. Like people always ask in the business course, how important really is social media? And if you don't mind, I can just quickly go over what we have. Uh, sorry that I've got to read it from here because it's much more effective. Don't make a fool of yourself on social media. Neediness and narcissism is easily detected by viewers. Be natural, maintain your sense of humor and appear unpretentious. There is nothing more annoying than seeing deluded egoic people constantly in your news, uh, your news feed. These serial posters abuse their welcome into your world, just like lingering drunks who overstay at your party. For many people, likes are the new love. Social media is not reality. People want you to think they are leading a carefree and glamorous lifestyle, whilst in truth, many are unhappy and popping antidepressants in between photo shoots, tongue in cheek there, of course. Addiction to likes breeds codependency. Just remember, the people who originally advised, advised us to do daily posts to grow our networks were actually the owners of the social media company, mm -hmm. wanting us to become addicted to their products, just like pornography or junk food. <laughs> pornography now occupies between 70 to 90% of all web traffic. The majority of people and businesses I know have not significantly grown their followers for 10 years. Overexposure is not a good thing. More is not better. Quality trumps quantity. Maintain some dignity and mystery. I love that. <laughs> Look, Catherine, people are always saying social media managers that know nothing, including uh, just about everyone I know, they say, oh, you've got to do a daily post. You've got to do... We've been doing them since 2010 and nothing's happened. <laughs> and basically people saying, oh, but they're filling up your teacher trainings and workshops. No, every student we've got in teacher training has been with the most powerful and effective of all marketing, which is word of mouth. I love that. It's such a great message. Now, I have to ask because in yoga, as you know, there's a poverty mentality. What is the best way for people to overcome poverty mentality in yoga? Develop a code of ethics for your business. And part of that code is that it is okay for you to prosper. Mm -hmm. Like I took a vow of poverty for years because I had such a problem with money and money is energy and you can use it badly and you can use it well. I come from an older paradigm that I despised of in order to succeed in business, you have to stand on top of somebody else. And that's the only way that there is. And it's like, no, I'm not going to do that. There has to be an ethical way to have business. So I can be proud of myself and the way I conduct my business, not by hurting anyone else. And 
I think it's very important to start to develop a code of ethics that makes you proud of yourself. And that needs to include that you get to prosper. That has to be part of it. But that I think what's most important is that your creativity, you get inspired, you inspire your students, your spirit is nourished by your work. Because if you do not include your heart and spirit, then your gift to the world is empty. I love that. Thank you. Now, as you know, when you go to social media, like let's just take Instagram, for example, Uh you know, the, the cliche is some yoga teacher doing some ridiculous pose that the average person would never in their lifetime even attempt and uh, and that's supposed to be the paradigm of yoga, right? Yeah. So- <laughs> oh, look, I mean, social media is an absolute joke. And Instagram, it seems to be even worse than Facebook because now Instagram is going into soft porn. You know, uh, I, I don't know if you've seen this, but there's many, many soft porn posts and and the girls are getting younger and younger. I was showing Anna that my concern was, you know, you used to have models 19 years and over. Now the models are 9, 10, 11 years old. And I was saying to Anna, this is not a good look. And, you know, the yoga teachers, uh, some yoga teachers use social media very well. And it's usually the more older and experienced. But the younger ones, oh, my God, Catherine, the same old shit since 2010. I look at it and go, oh, oh, my God. You know, doing poses here, there, everywhere. And they think that doing a daily post is advancing their career. Actually, it's stealing their time, energy, and focus. Better to put those hours into yoga practice, piano practice, singing practice, acting practice. Put it into what feeds your soul. Mm. Like I said, the social media addiction is exactly the same addiction as pornography. There is no difference, except that the subject matter is different. These and it's mostly women, I got to say, because for every one man yoga teacher, there's a hundred yoga women teachers for it. So it's become a narcissistic playground for a lot of women. And they know that, you know, maybe if I do something in my bikini or underwear, this yoga sequence, then I'm going to get more likes. And it's true. They do. They get more likes uh you know, the skimpy of the clothing. Unfortunately, that's the way it is because the reality is 70 to 90% is pornography, the internet, which is incredible. One thing that I want to bring in, because this is something I'm, I'm really deeply concerned about, is when people want to improve their business, they need to go back to their health. Jose and I were discussing that 70 plus percent of our people are on pharmaceutical drugs and it's like my friends you need to get off of drugs because they make you stupid and sick (laughs) regardless of what you've been told you're trying to gather information about you taking these drugs from the drug dealer of course the drug dealer wants you to take them because that's how the drug dealer makes money so i have i have to share this story because i have a new client and she she was basically insulting me. And she said, you know, you're really challenging my idea of what a spiritual person is because you have so much energy. <laughs> How, you know, dare you? How dare you? How dare you, Catherine? You know, and I, I don't take any drugs. It's like, okay. And, and I, I just sort of listened to her and it was like, well, yeah, everything that I do requires a lot of energy. So by cultivating your personal chi through your yoga practice, through good eating, through positive intention, through staying grounded and, you know, not losing sleep over not knowing where your money is. (laughs) And also music and the arts. The arts should also be a spiritual practice. You know, that enriches your spirit so greatly. You're absolutely right, Catherine. You, you're you bubbling with energy and you don't need to be medicated to do this. But unfortunately, 70% of all Americans are on some form of medication. And in a lifetime, an American will pop 30,000 pills. 
that's including aspirin as well. Google that and then you'll see where the real crisis in America lies. Well, that, and that's why we run the natural healing show for UK Health Radio to talk about how we can heal ourselves naturally. So in a forest, Jose Calarco, brilliant insights. Any final thoughts for our audience about how people can make an excellent living as a yoga teacher? Well, firstly, we need to define success differently mm -hmm. as well, because people think that you just got to be mm -hmm. rich or famous to get success. But health is wealth, doing what we love, uh, doing what we love, working for ourselves. There is so many different ways to define success. Don't just think that success is being famous and, you know, uh, having like 100,000 followers. That is not success. That's superficial success. Health is wealth, doing what we love. You know, that is my message to, to redefine success. And to also look deeply at what you're doing with your students. Are you making a difference in their life? What do they look like when they come into you in the beginning of class? And what do they look like after to really soak that in? Like, look at the difference you made for them. Mm. That, that's so crucial because it'll give you the heart to continue, especially when it's hard times. Beautiful message. And um, Jose Calarco and Anna Forrest, where can people find out about your business course? Well, uh, we have teacher trainings in Barcelona in September. We have an advanced teacher training in Athens. And of course you can do our, if you can't get to Athens or Barcelona, you can do the course online. And as you do the course online, you get all the courses that Anna and I write besides the yoga, all the off the mat activities. And, and that's at www.forest with two R's dot yoga. <laughs> You've been listening to the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer, Amazon number one bestselling author and yoga teacher. And we've been listening to Anna Forrest, Jose Calarco. You can find out more about their wonderful work at forest with two R's dot yoga. And remember, <laughs> it is blessed to make a living as a yoga teacher because then you help yourself and everyone around you. Thank yes, you. Work with a purpose. Work with a purpose. Thanks yeah. so much for listening and we'll see you next time.